and uh, Craig, if I look at the die roll, awesome. you go first. All right, I'm Craig Foster. I have one minute. Um, my trip to this stage started um, in 2009 when I volunteered in my daughter's classroom for two hours a day. I retired in 1998. I was in Malibu. And they said, be a nice guy, volunteer. So two hours became four, became all day, became two hours the next day, two more hours, became a master's degree, became a teaching certificate, 30 seconds. Became um, head of the PTA at Webster. Um, and this is my passion. Educating kids is maybe the most important thing we do. It's certainly what I care about. Um, and I'm here to make a difference for the kids of this district. I'm here um, to think about innovation. I'm here to think about um, every child's education and finding that passion that lies in every child that we can bring out to give them the best shot at a wonderful life they can have. Thank you. The next candidate will be Richard Kabilgaran Jessel. Congratulations, that was perfect that he said my name. Um, I want to thank everybody um, for coming this evening and the opportunity um, to speak. Uh, my name is Richard. I am the father of two children in the school district. I have one child who is at Santa Monica High School and one who is at Lincoln Middle School. My wife and I have lived in Santa Monica for the last 16 years and I'm a full professor at Santa Monica College teaching political science. I'm also the co-chair of Santa Monica's for renters' rights and believe um, truly that the protection of our neighborhoods and the good lives that we hope to lead here in Santa Monica really maps directly to education. For me, education is a ticket to the middle class. It's my personal story, and education is a reflection of my commitment to social justice. I wanted to serve on the board for a long time, and I'm happy to be vying for the open seat. My name is Richard to Builder and Jess Swin. Great. Next candidate is serving as student body president at Santa Monica High, I decided to commit my life to public service. Uh, I finished my master's degree in public administration and I returned to work at Santa Monica High. So I have a unique perspective of being a former student, also a former employee of our school district, and I served as uh, president of the school board in 2007-2008. I'm proud to say that um, 
I'm one school board member that you can count on to hold staff accountable, to stand with parents and students when uh, there are controversial issues. I'm proud of my record on the school board. Um, I have a personal commitment to serving the students of our school district. Um, current, the, I'm the, uh, currently the uh, founder and executive director of the People Youth and Family Center. We work with students mostly from Olympic High School, students who uh, have great needs, and that's why I'm running for re-election to the school board to ensure those students receive services. Now we will get to the prepared questions, and then again we'll do them randomly. And then that is, Addy. <laughs> so, according to your bio, you are helping students cope with the college admissions process. I am. When I was a high school student, we took the ACT, the SAT, possibly the PSAT, and we submitted our GPA. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, there are numerous AP classes. GPAs of 5.0 are possible. Colleges want to know where you did your volunteer work, and application essays are required to be great works of literature if you plan to attend a top tier school. Mm -hmm. Do you think we are demanding too much of our students? And are top tier schools really worth the pressure, and more importantly, the money? Shouldn't kids have <coughs> time to be kids? I don't want to disappoint you, but I want to throw out everything he just said. Um, <laughs> I'm a college consultant. I am not a college counselor, and there's a little bit of a difference. We travel around the country, we tour, and we study colleges. So when you come to me as a college consultant, you are getting what Harvard is versus Yale, versus Brown, versus Columbia, versus UCLA, versus USC. My students usually pick about 14 schools, we divide them up. We have three or four top tier schools. I have them pick some 50-50s and I have them pick safety schools. They do their essays and when I'm looking at them and when I'm listening to them and when I, parents count, but this is their four years, not the parents' four years. Very important to understand. If a parent went to Penn and has to have the kid apply to Penn, fine. But if that's not the right school for the student, he's not going to get in. And so you can have top tier grades, you can have great SAT scores, you can have a wonderful essay. I have seen school after school after school say no. And they'll take a kid with a 2.9. And you think, what happened? The kid with a 2.9 had the fit that the school wanted. And we talk to admissions officers across the country. They come in and talk to us. In fact, I'm meeting for Indianapolis for the NACAC convention, where I'll be meeting all of them soon. Um, and we know what they're looking for. They will give us their little tweaks. Um, I'll give you a perfect example, I've got 15 seconds. Um, University of Chicago. You know, if what do you do, early action? Do you do uh, early decision? Do you go regular admissions? What do you need? That's what schools really want. They want a fit. Thank you. As a professional, you have, no, I'm asking. You have two minutes to reply. As a professional industrial hygienist, I've been following this issue. And since you mentioned this topic in your bio, I'm going to ask you this question. There appear to be some possible environmental problems in Malibu High School, and the district has spent half a million dollars to deal with them. Soil remediation was performed after testing and from the presence of contaminants, and nobody was informed. When word leaked out, hysteria ensued, whether it was justified or not. The representative of the EPA has stated that everything could have been performed for half the cost. A recent news item noted that the latest round of PCB testing was performed incorrectly, so the results were not released, and the tests would need to be redone. Now there are also concerns about mold, and other issues due to improper upkeep. What actions would you take to improve this situation and the relationship between the administration and the public that is facing possible exposure of your child? That's a very good question, and it is something I am concerned about. I, I don't claim to know all the answers, but something should be done. I, I think um, either the caulking should be encapsulated or um, they should, um, you know, have portables 
for the children to be in until they are sure that the classrooms are safe. I think, I think it is a very important issue and I think it's a shame that so much money was spent. This is one of my concerns just in general about waste and I think, uh, and not only that, and I think a lot of money was probably also spent for lawyers to protect the district from liabilities and so on. I, I'm not totally articulate off the top of my head about everything, but I, I have um, gone to board meetings and I know parents are very concerned and I'm personally very concerned. I think these, these PCBs could very well actually lead to <coughs> cancer down the road for some of these uh, teachers and students who are inhabiting those classrooms. I think something should be done. I think there should be a meeting where scientists and people who really want to solve the problem get together and figure this out. Um, you know, we, we can't just uh, put it under the rug anymore. Great. Thank you very much. You mentioned that you want to create a shared vision of opportunity. Do you feel that some students in the district are not getting the same opportunities as others? If so, who are they and what can be done to improve this situation? Yeah. I think there's a lot of kids in the district who aren't getting the best opportunity they can get. Um, the real opportunity for a child is to be seen for who that child is. We have dancers, we have painters, we have mathematicians, we have astronauts, we have scientists, and somewhere, and a lot more, of course, and somewhere they need to be connected with that. They don't need to feel that they're inadequate mathematicians or their spelling isn't good enough. They need to say, I am a fantastic whatever I was put here to do. Um, so for me, child-centered education as a teacher is about not me lecturing to all of you and you have to figure out how to learn my way. As a teacher, my job is to find each of you where you live and make sure you learn what you need to learn in order to prosper in the world, and along the way find that special thread that you can hang on to no matter what you do in your life. You know this is what I was put here to do, as I found at 48 years old that this is what I was put here to do. So, you know, that's one level of it. Obviously, there's another level, uh, BSS, the Vision for Student Success, is working hard to raise the level of resources at every school and to equalize that level of resources so that every child will have the same material advantages of every other child. Um, and I think there's another piece, which is uh, collaboration at our school sites between the parents and the principal and the district and the community makes for that school site, that neighborhood, that community to create its own sense of excellence in its own image. And I am very, very committed to collaboration, whether it's working with fellow school board members or whether it's each one of our school sites finding that little excellence. I think that's how the future becomes great, that we work together to find that excellence and bring it into the world. Please expand on your ideas for creative funding options and how you would guarantee the funds made it to the classroom instead of administration. Would you deny raises to those at the top? We are often told that the only way to get the best people is to pay them the most money. I think uh, in our school district, when, when you study uh, how much we pay, um, we're competitive, so we're not you know, we're not way too high and we're not, you know, anywhere near the low end. Uh, and I think we need to compensate people to be competitive, to attract people to come to work in our school district. I mean, the, there is a higher standard of living. It's a little bit more expensive, you know, to rent out here um, or to own um, a home and so forth. Um, so that's hard for us to attract people like the superintendent and so forth. Um, that being said, you know, there are a lot of creative options, for example, and we see it with the vision for student success, you know, centralized fundraising, which was, a, I'm very proud of that policy because, you know, the concept is to bring equity into our public education system. Um, getting parents, you know, to, to, to make donations so that we can share those resources district-wide, I think is a very good policy, and, and I'm very proud that, that we, uh, you know, that I had uh, a little to do in implementing that policy. 
We can also look for grants. Uh, there's a lot of money out there. There's state dollars, there's uh, federal dollars, there's partnerships with nonprofit organizations. You know, we, we can leverage, um, you know, our, our, um, our resources to bring in other support services. For example, one creative thing that we did is we um, partnered with the Boys and Girls Club to have uh, facilities on site. So at John Adams Middle School, we have a Boys and Girls Club on site where young people can take advantage of the after school programs and tutoring that exists in, in those facilities. We also have the same thing at Malibu High School. And the students at the high school and the middle school can take advantage of those services as well. Um, so that's what I mean, you know, in terms of how we can leverage those resources uh, to ensure that, you know, we relieve the, the, the burden on taxpayers, but we find, you know, creative ways to bring resources and support for the students in our school district. So, you state that you have a reputation for pursuing justice. In a recent situation at Samuel High, an incomplete video surfaced of a teacher attacking a student in a classroom. The district superintendent immediately suspended the teacher before getting any further facts. Ultimately, apologies were made and the teacher was returned to the classroom with no demerits made to his personnel file. Do you think justice was achieved in this case? Do you think the superintendent deserved the merits in her personal file? Would you have handled it in any different, any way differently as the teacher in the classroom? And what about the student? Did he deserve what he got? <laughs> Two minutes starts when I speak. You don't want to start. jump to conclusions and be able to answer a question like that because that question uh, requires that I would have had to been I'm not on the school board I'm not in the closed sessions I don't know what took place with personnel and I don't know everything that there is to know about this so to ask whether or not I would have done something differently um, while it might seem fair in a forum like this um, in all honesty it would be the wrong thing for me to do to try to answer. What I will say with this notion of justice is that what we've got going on in our school district, there are too many kids who aren't being seen, and particularly at this high school, Santa Monica High School, we have two different schools. We have the schools where kids are working hard and doing the APs and taking the tests and the practice exams. And we've got kids who are being lost in the back rows of these classrooms. <laughs> We have teachers who are doing everything they possibly can with limited resources to reach those kids. And I can't possibly say whether or not I think that that teacher did the right thing in that particular moment. From what I heard, like many people in this room have probably heard, that teacher had a personal relationship with that child. We should do everything we possibly can to support the men and women who are doing the difficult work in the trenches. Kids need to be seen and have an opportunity, a pathway to a better life. For me, that meant education. Growing up in a public housing unit in Long Beach, California, being with a single mother, recognizing that to be the first one out with a college degree meant that education was the justice. I would be fully committed to making sure we see every child. We have one school that is a school that everybody is going to succeed. Thank you. Please discuss your understanding of the city's Cradle to Careers initiative and whether or not it is, it is having a positive That's a good question. Um, I, I am not as, as informed as I should be about all aspects of the Cradle to Career initiative. I think there are some very good aspects to it, but I have to say that there is something about it, some aspects of it that strike me a little bit as being too controlling. I, I think uh, the, uh, push to put children into pre-kindergarten and so on, you know, may be good under some circumstances for some families, but I don't think that everybody should be regimented into, into all of the aspects of this cradle to career program. I think, I think we do need to um, continue holding on to our freedoms and um, values that 
our country was founded on. And I think that, uh, again, there are positive aspects to this program and aspects that I'm not that familiar with, but my, my general feeling is that there are some aspects to it that should perhaps be um, changed so that we don't regiment children into uh, an early education situation if it's not going to help them. It should be an individualized situation. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. The rest of these questions were submitted by a member. What would you do to address, address the issue of the temperature in our classes, which can sometimes be as high as 85 to 90 degrees, and will definitely have an impact upon a student's ability to absorb information? Oh, that's a, a very, uh, very good question. Um, my, my son attends uh, Edison Language Academy right now, and Edison has a distinction in our community because of the voters approving uh, Measure BB. Uh, we were able to rebuild Edison Language Academy, and it's the only school right now that's, that was totally rebuilt. When it was rebuilt, the design included uh, what they call solar chimneys, and we were promised that these uh, structures were going to re regulate the, uh, you know, the heat and without having to have air conditioning, that, we, that it was going to work well. Uh, nobody could have predicted the type of heat wave you know, that we've been getting hit with. I mean, it, it's punishing. And I can tell you that with all the promise of technology, uh, it was a complete failure. And now, if you go to those classrooms, you have uh, fans. You know, so, so we're going back to an old model uh, of electricity and, and, and using fans to cool down those classrooms. Y you know, being on the school board and, and looking at the design, you think that these things are supposed to work. But I can tell you this, that there's that as a school board member, uh, I'm gonna do everything I can to ensure that we don't make the same mistakes. That uh, we have a new bond now, Measure ES, that's $389 million. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of construction, a lot of promises, and we wanna make sure we hold people accountable that we, you know, we, sh we should have asked, you know, has this ever been done ever before? And how does it work? Um, so I'm a little embarrassed, you know, by what has occurred. But I want to hold us accountable, make sure that the district is uh, being held accountable. I'm not one that is going to uh, be shy about being transparent and, be, you know, with, with the mistakes that, you know, we make. Um, so I'll talk, talk, talk honestly about that. Right now, the, the only thing that we have is fans. And, and in terms of cooling the, the classroom down, that's what's working right now at Edison Language Academy. I'm assuming it's working elsewhere. Thank you. Prior to campaigning, when was the last time you visited a school site when I was in session <laughs> to assess what happened in the classroom when I was on campus for a session? Wow. Um, every day. Um, and I think the great benefit of being a parent in this community is that we have such incredibly uh, welcoming campuses. Um, I would say particularly at the elementary school level. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk about the joy of learning and the idea of having um, parents be full partners with um, those who have no children in our community but who also care about education as is the case with our Cradle to Career and our wellness initiative in the city and our lifelong learning programs. Uh, I have been able to serve um, school site governance council at Roosevelt Elementary School at Lincoln Middle School I am on the PTA at, uh, was at the PTA at the Roosevelt Elementary School. I am on the district-wide PTA. I'm currently the Vice President uh, for Education. And I am the uh, former Booster Club President for Roosevelt, as well as a uh, leader, uh, co-chair of the Direct Investment Campaign for Santa Monica High School. I've served also um, on the Superintendent's Advisory um, Council and took a, a very active role in the implementation of the Vision for Student Success um, in the three schools uh, in partnering with Grant, Franklin, and Roosevelt. Um, each and every day, being a classroom parent, volunteering, we're able to see, I'm able to see the, in, the incredible work that takes place between teacher and student and recognizing that we need to be supporting teachers more. We need to be uh, addressing classroom size. We need to be addressing facilities questions. The question about temperatures in classrooms is key. We have to have safe working and learning environments. Um, I'm on campuses all the time, and I plan to be in Malibu schools this Thursday. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
that I'm working on a statewide program currently. Uh, everything is in place for it to be effective within a month. There's one little glitch that I have to get straightened out before I can make it fully work. And I've got to figure out who's going to help support this. Um, but we're ready to roll. This is guaranteed money. In this pot of money, there is I don't want to misquote it, but I think it was $2.1 million that's been set aside for these individuals to go back to school. If I can make it work, and I can get Santa Monica School District on board, they can make $350 off each individual who participates in the program, guaranteed money, and that would go into the schools to help build build the school back up. Great. Thank you. So great. Here's the last question. Mm -hmm. You'll each have two minutes to address any issue that another person would ask or make a general statement that I chose, whichever you choose. Okay. Uh, one of my big issues is the Malibu crisis that they're undergoing. And I'm very concerned about this. Um, when I first heard about it, a lot of bells and whistles went off in my head. And I later learned somebody sitting on the board had been in the same career I had been in, where we dealt with asbestos, we dealt with um, other situations similar to this, usually involved a lot of attorneys. And I was wondering what had happened. I was more alarmed three weeks ago when I was in the court courthouse saying goodbye to a judge who had been a mentor for many years. And he, this woman came up, who was a friend of mine, and told me that this person had been working in her firm. And I was appalled because I had asked a question and had gotten zero response. And I felt being a member of the BAP ADAPT board that somebody could have said something, and I was like, I wasn't even there. I have met with Malibu. Not only do we have three teachers with thyroid cancer, we have 14 more who are sick. And more alarming to me is my son is 28 years old. He's getting thinking about getting married, having children, buying his first home. And four boys in the very same class in Malibu are fighting thyroid. Now, they're telling me it's $60 per test, and they've thrown up the idea that there's two schools in Santa Monica that they want to look at, also because they want to see what the levels are. I think it's at least worth trying it, and I think the board needs to be more transparent about what's going on, and this is a really big issue with me. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so I'm from Malibu. And there hasn't been anybody from Malibu on the school board since, two, uh, sorry, elected since 2004, serving since 2008. So when something like the Malibu toxins comes up, um, I think it's worth considering that having a voice from that community on the school board would be a good thing to do. Um, I have, as you've heard, a couple of simple premises that I live by, and one of them as a teacher is kids learn more from what you do than what you say. And we're in a really I mean, horrible but important position to show our children how to live in a world with toxins, a world that we've filled with things that are maybe not good for us, probably not good for us, or in some cases, certainly not good for us. And it's our kids who's going to fix this, who are going to fix this. Um, and if we address it in a way that does ourselves dignity and justice, then we can teach them how to live in a world with these issues. So we, I've said from the beginning that we've got to do three things as regard to the Malibu toxins. One is we have to test. 
two is we have to talk about the results because there is no science no book you can look up that tells you the absolute facts in this regard there's lots of different facts from lots of people saying lots of different things and then based on those community discussions event back to collaboration again we need to work together and find what it is that we believe and we believe needs to be done then we remediate as much or as little as um, needs to be done in that, in, in that situation. And we are in a position now where the community and the school board are very much at odds because that collaboration is broken down and because those conversations are broken down. And it's a really big problem in our community. F forget about the toxins, which could be really horrible depending on what the science turns out to be. Our schools are fragmented. Kids have left our schools, they've lost their friends, they're in home schools that they never planned to be in, um, and that's a big problem in and of itself. So collaboration is the key. Thank you. Great. I, I very much agree with some of the things I heard, for example, from Craig about the concerns about the uh, B2Bs and health issues and what the good thing about Spirit. And thank you, Esther, for, for your um, part in all of this. And uh, I, think, I think that it's important to safeguard the health of our kids. And I think uh, this is even a broader issue than, than perhaps uh, we're all focusing on um, in the sense that there are other issues of health also that we should think about, such as um, the radiation, the microwave radiation from wireless devices that um, are being put into classrooms. I understand the district is considering spending $34 million, uh, with uh, technological upgrades and uh, while technology is important, and certainly we can't uh, we can't go backwards, we, we do want to move forward with technology, but uh, it, it should be done in a way that's safe for the kids. And there are issues about that, and also there are uh, nutritional issues. I mean, we need to give our kids real facts. There's just a lot of propaganda being given out there, and like organizations like PCRN has sued certain institutions twice and one regarding uh, you know incorrect facts that are being given and so kids need real facts and they need they need uh, healthy whole foods plant-based options uh, and they need um, you know as I already said protection from um, you know too much wireless radiation and um, so I, I think uh, there are broader health issues that we need to be concerned about. Great. I'm going to Andrew, I can come to you. This was also an opportunity to answer questions that we wanted to address, but we didn't. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to combine two questions. Um, before I do, though, I want to say that um, everybody who works in our school district um, deserves a safe working and learning environment. Safe. Um, and as a man who's in remission from cancer, I think that um, there's a serious question about health, and we have to address it. And I think we're on it. And we're headed in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to address the questions that were asked um, early. Andrew, you asked the question specifically about are the kids doing too much, the ACTs, the SATs, the APs, all of this business, and point to the Youth Wellness Report Card. We have too many kids who are registering that they are depressed, that there's a depression, there's anxiety, there is this incredible pressure to be this top tier um, in their academics, which we should support children being challenged, certainly. The kids should be able to be kids and to follow the joy of learning. Uh, I know it's kind of touchy-feely, but I really think that we <laughs> need to identify what the kids want to study and, and support them in those endeavors. We have two different tracks happening too much in this district, and we need to close the achievement gap. We need to make sure that children have a pathway to success. There was a question asked about community benefits. We know in this city that so much talk is about development these days. We need to make sure that we are getting community benefits that are geared to education and that the people in the community are able to weigh in and say what those community benefits should be in support of education. Um, there's so much more that we can be doing to, um, in, uh, to assist the, the teachers to assist those who are in the business of educating our kids. I hope to be um, one who will get your vote on November 4th. I wanna say that I am the teacher's choice. I'm the only non-incumbent with the Santa Monica and Malibu Classroom Teachers Association endorsement and SEIU, Unite Here, and the LA County Federation of Labor. I hope 
you'll vote for me. Thank you. Thank you all. I uh, will mention uh, we did have two candidates who sent their regrets that they could not be here. Roy Biederman is an incumbent, and Ralph Nectar is also an incumbent. But I'd like to take a moment and thank all of the candidates for the Thank you. Um, my name is Barry Snell, and um, I want to thank you first for hosting this event. I have uh, been an uh, uh, educational advocate since uh, my kids and I moved into this district over 15 years ago. I have three of my students, two, three of my children go through the school system, and I uh, started out with PTA and subsequently ran for office and became a school board member with Oscar on, on the school board. Because my my educational background has allowed me to be in this position. I uh, subsequently, after the school board, got involved with, uh, with a number of activities within the community, first with the, with the peer committee and then with the downtown Santa Monica committee. I've been an advocate for education for all kids and the reason that I'm now uh, seeking for re-election with the college board, uh, which I was appointed in February, was because uh, I realized that this is the natural progression for me. Thank you. My name is Dennis Frisch. I have just finished a 35-year career in teaching, uh, having retired from Santa Monica College after 28 years. Uh, the last 28 years teaching in community colleges have been extraordinarily rewarding, and it is my great passion. Uh, I, at Santa Monica College, I was very active in both the Academic Senate and the Faculty Association uh, in numerous ways as a leader in the Faculty Association. I also, at the state level, I was active in two uh, organizations, faculty organizations, actually created one of them, helped create one of them, the Community College Independence, and then I just finished two years as president of Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. I think with that kind of background, I have the skills uh, and the knowledge uh, to be an effective, contributing, positive member of the Board of Trustees at Santa Monica. teacher, a social worker, a community organizer, an, education, an, an educator, a combination that has taken me far, whether teaching in a two-room classroom on the Navajo Reservation, establishing a model community policing program in West Hollywood, or working at UCLA, um, particularly with victims of sexual assault, um, to serving on the Board of trust, Trustees, where in 2003, I actually negotiated the first lead bill and receiving money from the city. And, um, and my time is up, and I'm going to say I really care about the students, and um, you can meet me afterwards, and I'll tell you all the information. <laughs> my name is Maria Loya, and I'm running for SMC Board of Trustees because I want to ensure that SMC works to better serve local students and residents. Uh, we have such a great college that provides good classes and good programs. I just want to make sure that our local students are accessing it. Less than 20% of, uh, of, of, of the student population at SMC are from Santa Monica and Malibu. I think that needs to, that needs to change. We can do better. Uh, also, uh, only 17% of students from our district place into college level math and English. I think that's problematic. I think we can do better by engaging in a partnership with our school district. Uh, I hope to get your vote and to ensure that Santa Monica College works to better serve local students and residents. Thank you. Uh, I'm Louise Jaffe. I'm president of the California Community College Trustees and I'm a trustee at Santa Monica College. I'm passionate about access and excellence in public education. That's why I founded the Santa Monica Lifelong Learning Community Project. I served as PTA president for Rogers, Sam Ohai, and PTA Council, and I'm a founding member and former co-chair of Community for Excellent Public Schools. My leadership on the SMC board has helped our exceptional community college become a model of student access and success, sustainability, and fiscal responsibility. My record includes keeping SMC number one in transfers to UC, 
helping to create a strong partnership with Samuel High, supporting Extraordinary Broad Stage, and protecting Emeritus College so that everyone in our community can benefit from SMC. I'm proud that Santa Monica College provides all Santa Monicans unparalleled access to high quality public higher education. Um, and I get, look forward to the questions. Thank you. You are endorsed by the Santa Monica College Faculty Association and you bemoan the corporatization of Santa Monica College. Are these two items related? And please explain what you mean by corporatization and how does it impact students? Well, let me take the, uh, the first question about uh, corporatization. Uh, I think corporatization is something which uh, has been affecting the community colleges for about the last five to seven years. Uh, it is something which actually the K through 12 system has been struggling with. By that I mean uh, you have a tendency to begin to think in business terms, not in educational terms. Uh, we begin to think in terms of students as commodities, not as human beings who we are trying to uh, help to achieve educational goals and things like that. Uh, at Santa Monica College, I, uh, and it's in the state of California, I've noticed that corporatization is beginning to express itself in a tendency to want to rely too much on quantitative data uh, to indicate whether a student is successful or not. Now, that's problematical at best uh, because community college uh, students come from such a diverse background. Uh, and simple quantification measures simply are not going to tell you that much. Uh, at Santa Monica College, the recent effort to uh, create a two-tiered system uh, with full-cost courses was an expression of that kind of corporatization. Fortunately, I was leader of back when we walked that first bill. And uh, at Santa Monica College the following year, uh, unfortunately, as the district continued to pursue that idea in a different way, we had the unfortunate pepper spray incident come about, partly as a result of that uh, effort. Uh, so I think that uh, this is something that I'm very, very concerned about and passionate about and have fought against already and will continue to do so as a member of the Board of Trustees. One of your priorities is to ensure access to students. Do you mean local students or any students? What about students from other countries? Should they have the same access? Santa Monica College brags that it has more students attend from other countries than any other community college. Exposure to other cultures is a great thing. But is it shutting out our Californians by prioritizing the acceptance of those who pay higher fees? I'm, I'm just putting the access for all students. And the reason for it is that I believe that we, we are in a, our students are in a state where we are a global society and that our educational system is one that our kids have to be prepared to be able to compete on a global level. I, do support the fact that we need to encourage as many of our students to to uh, to uh, to go to college. Uh, one of the things that I've always talked about in my career is that uh, that my access uh, to I'm a CPA and my access to the uh, CPA world was as a result of being this part of the uh, the league for our country to have more minorities in the business world. And if I didn't have that access, I wouldn't have been able to achieve some of the goals that I did as a CPA. So I do not uh, to profess to limit access to anyone. However, I want to support as much as we can our students in our community. I think that our, our students, and quite honestly, I've had two of my, three of my students, three of my own uh, children who will go through the system, two of them are presently at the college. So I'm quite supportive of our students getting as much education as possible, but I don't uh, profess to want to limit any access because I believe in the long run that, uh, that we are a global society and that the uh, ability for our students to engage with all other students is one that will benefit all. Okay. You manage campus community oriented safety programs at UCLA to ensure a safe academic environment for students. With the horrific violence that played out on campus last year still fresh in our minds, do you fear 
field that allowing students and faculty to carry concealed weapons would make the campus any safer? What can be done to increase the safety of students, faculty, and staff from random acts of gun violence? Let, let me just start by saying I do not believe in allowing people to carry concealed weapons. I don't think that makes it any place safer. And going to the main part of your question is what can be done. It was a horrific incident, and um, we were really fortunate to have so many staff, faculty, and of course the police just step in and take leadership. And it's just amazing how they put their lives at risk to ensure that our students were as safe as possible. The college had already started um, doing its, its active shooter programs, and they had already begun um, providing active shooter um, programs and they had just trained some of the staff who works in the library. The shooter was in the library. He was shooting through the door where a number of people were hiding. And in, it's referred to as the safe room, and people actually thought it was a, a room to be safe in, but it was actually the room where the safe was. <laughs> has to extend not only to the, the industry, the high-tech industry, but it has to start at the school district. Right now we have a program, a dual enrollment program, but it's limited to history and music, I believe. I think that we can start a dual enrollment program that focuses on computer science. So the students, once they're in uh, high school, can already start to get on that path and, and get the training that they need. So when they uh, enter into SMC, they are uh, better prepared to be successful uh, what in the courses at SMC. Now, um, and, and from there, I think it's important that SMC uh, build those uh, partnerships with that industry to ensure that, that there's uh, internships that lead to employment. Now, currently, a lot, of the, a lot of the employees that are coming in to uh, work at these high-tech companies are coming in from the outside, you know, are coming in from out of town, out of state, you know, out of the country. And so I think that uh, those jobs should go to local residents. Uh, and I believe that part of that is, is falls on the responsibility of the government entities within our city that include uh, and shouldn't be limited to just S and C, but as well as the school district and the city of Santa Monica, as well as the industry. So I think by working together, we can ensure that we create a pathway to employment that essentially will alleviate not just uh, the issue of, of uh, the issue of, of lack of access to these quality jobs from our local residents, but also help alleviate the issues of traffic, help, help alleviate the issues of gentrification that's currently taking place. Now, in terms of, uh, oh. <laughs> you say you have a record of collaborating with our high schools, but only 20% of the student population is from Santa Monica and Malibu. What have you done and what will you do to increase this number? Is it in Santa Monica College's best interest to increase this number? And why? Um, Santa Monica College actually has the highest participation rate of community members in the district 
using a college of anywhere in the state. This is a new metric that is coming out from the chancellor's office, and we blow every other community college out the map. This is the college campus. We have about 30 people in this room now. This is a catalog. Um, we could go through and say, what class do you want to take? That's my husband. He's taking geographic mapping systems. Uh, Gina takes things various times. Um, it takes 18 people in a class to pay for the class. So if we only serve Santa Monica residents in the college, we would be able to offer you one class. Which class does everyone in this room want to take? You don't. Because we are open and we allow and we serve people from the region, we are able to provide this incredible access to the classes that our residents want to take. And this applies to high school students too. So our high school students, about 30% of them, come to Santa Monica College as freshmen. The high school is very much geared towards getting students to go straight into a four-year college. So the idea that you want to incentivize more students to come to a two-year college, uh, if you're interested in student success, is a complicated discussion. The college is fabulous, but if you come here, you then have to go somewhere else, and there's a, a burden to that, uh, and we lose people. So, it's not true that we have low participation. We have very high participation. We, uh, and programs that I've worked on are dual enrollment at the state level. Uh, we had um, legislation that the league and the chancellor's office were trying to get, and it just died in appropriations uh, because there's resistance from high school faculty. Um, <laughs> and I'm just about run out of time. But we have dual enrollment. The Young Collegians program, I think, is the strongest program uh, that we really want to expand. And I'm part of Cradle to Career, which is all about trying to work and make this seamless so that these institutions are doing uh, everything you've heard about we are already doing somewhat. <laughs> you have a talk about your vision of the continuation of Santa Rita's College. I've heard from concerned residents that they are afraid of cuts being made and a reduction of class offerings. What value does Emirates provide? The Emirates are in the Middle East. Everybody's young. <laughs>
uh, which means some kind of providing some kind of housing uh, and that. I'm not sure actually it's a good idea. Uh, community college students are a very, very diverse group. Uh, housing, uh, as we know, at the four-year colleges can be expensive. Uh, I'm not sure if the college really wants to go in that direction. Uh, I'm not sure that if we offer uh, that kind of thing, that we aren't in fact excluding certain students from being able to come to Santa Monica College. Uh, and there is an awful lot of, of uh, things going on now, both statewide and at the college, that seem to imply that we are moving in the direction of trying to exclude some students from the community colleges. Uh, so this whole housing issue to me is um, at best dubious, and I would really want to know more about it uh, in order to kind of maybe alleviate some of my dubious thinking uh, or perhaps to solidify it. Uh, thank you. some thought about this. I, I actually think that it would be better for Santa Monica College to continue to focus on the two-year process for, for, for students. However, there are, are certain areas of uh, disciplines that um, that are four-year schools just because of the, the, uh, the amount of demand uh, are not able to uh, supply the classes for those particular students and I think that the community college is in an incredible position to be able to support, maybe partner with four-year institutions to possibly uh, be able to uh, uh, support those disciplines. However, I think the mission of the community college should be focused on our, for our two-year institutions to be able to look at the career paths, the technology paths for individuals. It's a different type of model. And so in certain particular disciplines like nursing, possibly where it's been difficult to, uh, for some of our students to be able to uh, get into our, our four-year schools because of the demand and, the, and because of the demand in our, in our society for these particular uh, careers, we may want to look and partner with particular four-year schools. But I, I do believe that uh, the model for our community college should be a two-year school, and I think that we could be more effective in that way. You're going to get this one. Some time ago, a past president of the college eliminated the vocational programs provided by the school in favor of focusing on being a conduit to four-year degrees. The college board at that time acquiesced to this idea, and valuable training programs were left by the wayside. <coughs> do you think this was a wise choice, and how do you feel about reinstating the valuable vocational programs? Uh, well, this is similar to the question you asked Richard. I, I was not there at that time, um, and I don't know the evaluation process that went into the decisions that were made. I know the college has a culture of studying issues before it takes action. Uh, we have about 70 career tech programs now. Here's recycling and resource management, uh, solar installation. I believe we have an automotive class that is a partnership with Sam High and he's in the classroom. And the way that the state, and but we are known largely, and, and our biggest uh, students are coming to us mostly because they want to move on to a four-year degree, although we also offer certificates. We live in a society now in an economy where four-year degrees are increasingly necessary. So that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. But we do have these other programs. We actually just won a grant uh, for $2 million for Emerge, which is information communication, entertainment, and um, technology systems. And the way the state now, we don't just say, okay, we wanna do this or that. The state is looking at career, uh, a, a funding career programs based on sector and region. So they have a program called Doing What Matters for Jobs in the Economy. And they're regional uh, consortiums, and they say, okay, this is, we do an environmental scan, so on this, on this grant we just got, 
Yes, there are need, there are employment opportunities that will be family supporting wages because we want fully offer programs to make sure they lead to jobs that provide wages that support families and that are stackable. So if you get a certificate in one of our programs and then later on you want to go back for another degree, the work that you did and the courses you took can be contribute to moving on. So uh, we continue to look at those areas, but we don't look at them in isolation, nor do we have the mandate or authority to look at them in isolation as part of the state's planning uh, and, and funding process. And, oops, it says stop, okay. <laughs> funding. <laughs> what plans are you aware of does the college have for building in our neighborhoods? Santa Monica College is not required to give to our city's planning review process. So how can we be involved in their building plans? Well, I, uh, I think that, that that is definitely an issue that needs to be dealt with. And if I'm elected, one of the first things that I'll do is I'll initiate a good neighbor initiative with the purpose of creating a space that would enhance communication between Santa Monica College and the neighborhoods, adjacent neighborhoods and neighborhood groups throughout the city uh, to provide the kind of information that you mentioned in terms of what kind of developments are going to be taking place within the city and to work in collaboration with the residents to ensure that as development happens, that it happens in a responsible and a respectful manner. Um, so that's one of the things that I believe is lacking, um, and, but I think that we can do better. I think that by initiating and creating that space, uh, we can get residents and Santa Monica College and the administration to start working together in collaboration. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the last section where you'll have a few minutes to address any issues in the first address or any issues you would like to speak. I really want to uh, convey to you uh, why I'm running for the Board of Trustees. Uh, as I indicated earlier, I have just completed 28 incredible years at Santa Monica College. And there is no doubt Santa Monica College is one of the premier community colleges in uh, California and is recognized nationally and potentially even worldwide uh, and that. So that was a very satisfying career. Uh, I also went on to do some very, very positive work, uh, both locally with the faculty uh, and uh, statewide uh, in Sacramento. Uh, but uh, working in Sacramento at first, I began to notice this issue of uh, corporatization, uh, where we're relying way too much on numerical measures of success. Uh, it has crept into the Student Success Initiative in very, very destructive ways, where student aid is linked to whether or not you're making normal progress. Normal progress means taking X number of courses, completing X number of courses in X number of time. Uh, and, that, and this is wrong. Community colleges were established to provide higher education to all California <laughs> residents, regardless of their socioeconomic background or their income. Uh, these kinds of measures begin to exclude students. Uh, it may be a financial exclusion, or it may be an academic exclusion. But nonetheless, students who have the hardest time affording even $46 a unit, which is very low, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is a burden for many of them. My goal is to ensure that all students have access to higher education and that Santa Monica College does not become a college that leads in areas that lead to corporatization. Thank you. First, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out tonight and listening to me. Um, I, uh, I, when I think about why I want to be a trustee for Santa Monica College, it's one because it's an incredible institution. However, uh, our society today is in a, really in a difficult situation. We, we have a situation where many uh, individuals in our, in our society are not being able to be represented. And I think education is the, the one area which uh, evens the playing field. I, um, I was looking at some statistics over, over the uh, 
students in, uh, in California, 85% of African American students in California uh, are reading below uh, grade level or math level. We've got, uh, since 1980, California has uh, instituted, built 80 prisons and only two, and only one college. I, I, I really understand that the only way that you can compete in society is to have the academically sound. And I really hope that uh, as we go through this uh, election season that you'll come up and speak to me. I don't do well in, in public forums. I'm a CPA, I'm a numbers guy. <laughs> I, look at, I look at things from the perspective of numbers. And there is an uh, incredible difference in uh, certain populations in our community that are being affected by the fact of the lack of education. And I mentioned earlier that they work a local society. If we do not take a look, and Craig mentioned it a little bit in his stage, but if we don't take a look and the destruction of our classroom and really take a look at the individuals that we have seated before us as, as teachers and administrators and as trustee members and say that we've got to be able to teach to where these individuals come from, be able to pull out that passion about education for those individuals. I know that I wouldn't be sitting on this, this dais with the rest of these individuals if I didn't have the academic background that I have. So I want to thank you uh, and I hope you'll support me in November. Well, as I mentioned before, I'm running for SMC Board of Trustees because I want to ensure that there's equity in our schools and to ensure that there's continued access and opportunity, in particular for local students. I, I don't think we should be satisfied that less than 20% of the student population at SMC comes from uh, our local schools. I think we can do better. Um, and one of the things that I would want to propose is, if I'm elected, I'd like to create uh, what I would call a Santa Monica College Promise. And that's a promise to ensure that local students have priority enrollment at Santa Monica College. Now, the fact that we have to, we as residents, we pay the taxes, the bonds that help build up Santa Monica College. We have to bear the burden of parking and traffic. We, uh, our local students should have priority enrollment, while at the same time have community, uh, have Santa Monica College serve uh, uh, throughout the region, but let's not leave our student, our local students behind. And so I think that, that um, having me on the board provides a unique perspective that currently is lacking. I'm a product of the community college system, I'm uh, the first generation in my family to attend college. I understand the realities of the students that are currently attending Santa Monica College. And I wanna make sure that as decisions are made, uh, that there's a, a resident and a community perspective. I don't want us to, to, as we grow bigger and bigger, leave our local students and local residents behind. We have such a great gem. We need to ensure that we make it work for local residents as well. So that's one of the reasons that I'm running. And I hope that, that uh, you vote for me in, in making sure that we put community back into Santa Monica College. Thank you. Uh, I want to touch on a few things. Um, this big housing plan, this is the first I've heard of it. We do not currently have plans that I'm aware of to do any housing. I don't know how we would fund that. Um, uh, and uh, the four-year college thing, we are also, there are no discussions to make Santa Monica College a four-year college. There, are, there is a bill uh, waiting on Governor Brown's desk that he has not signed that would permit 15 pilot colleges to offer a uh, four-year degree in an applied career tech field. There are all these fields, nursing is one of them, where the, uh, there is no capacity uh, Barry mentioned we haven't built more universities and we have uh, literally millions of more students who need post-secondary education. So there's a big capacity issue and we need to figure out ways to serve the real students we have here in our community and in our state. Uh, I'm interested in student success. I do believe in studying research. I, I am very much evidence focused. We cannot continue to do Something because we think it feels good and we throw mud against the wall when it's yielding results like 85% of black students not being able to read. This is not acceptable to anyone. 
and, and we've built um, an institutional research department so that we can begin to see what is effective, what's gonna make a difference, not, um, oh, this is a good idea. And, and that's part of what um, the well-being report card and the end cradle to career is doing too. It's like, what can we learn that can help us do a better job? It's not that no one's been trying to close the achievement gap. It's absolutely important that we have to do this, but we have to figure out how to do it. And when we have things that work, that's where we're gonna put our money. Those are the programs that we're expanding. And that's what we're doing. Uh, and we do, um, about 70% of our students, high school students are attending the college at one time or another, but not as full-time students. So it's a great college. Thank you, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to take a moment to, to thank all of our candidates for coming tonight.